to the Paranormal Pendle podcast, coming to you from the heart of Pendle Witch Country in the northwest of England. My name is Craig Bryant, author, investigator, and collector of stories. Join me as we take a journey into the paranormal, UFO sightings, cryptozoology, and big cats. This is the Paranormal Pendle podcast. Welcome to episode 14 of Paranormal Pendle, broadcasting to the UK Paranormal Radio Network at paukradio.com. So my guest on this episode is Debbie Hatswell. Um, Debbie is a um, phenomenon, phenomenist. <laughs> Do you know, I know I was going to have problems saying that. Um, yeah, phenomenist, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> writer, podcaster, uh, investigator, and the founding member of Being Believed Research and Investigations Group. Mm -hmm. uh, Debbie has studied the British Bigfoot and Dogman phenomena for almost 40 years, um, and she's researched over 4,000 personal witness accounts uh, from right across the globe. Uh, Debbie's based in Lancashire, and she's formed a team of volunteer investigators researching the many witness reports that are reported each week to BBR. And Debbie is a witness herself to um, an impossible creature that she saw in 1982. So I'm going to put you on the spot then. Let's go all the way back to 1982. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about this, uh, this creature that you saw? I will do. Um, I have to, a little bit of an apology at first. We can thank my friend Tammy for the phenonymist um, <laughs> label. I've um, been practising it for the last 20 minutes before we started it, recording. It, it, it basically, she, it was her who, who said it. She said it's when, you, you know, people say you're a paranormal investigator, you're into the UFO. What 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 you called if you do all of those subjects? And she said, well, a phenomenist. You studied the strange phenomenon. I thought, oh, yeah, that kind of fits. So we got Tammy to uh, blame for that. But um, jumping, you want me to jump straight in? That's easy <laughs> to do. <laughs> Strangely, at the time, I lived in a town called Pend Pendleton, which most people know that I live in Salford, but Salford's made up of a number of boroughs. So there's Pendleton, Pendlebury, Odd soul, but back then in the olden days, it was Salford five, Salford six. I lived in Pendleton, um, really normal northwest town, lots of terraces, some high rises, not a place that you'd expect to see a creature by any shape or form. And in the center of that, there's this park, um, and we all have them in our towns. It's an old Edwardian mansion that's just been left at council. And the park has a, a lot of ground, so it was just been left to rack and ruin, really. So everything was really overgrown, and as kids, we would sneak in there if we didn't want to go in school. Um, I was 15, so 1982. Never heard of Bigfoot or um, Sasquatch or any of that. Probably the abominable snowman or the Yeti, but that's something that happens thousands of miles away. Uh, never called him Bigfoot or anything like that myself until years of it. For me, he's always been the man ape. Um, lovely day, about half one, two in the afternoon, probably May, June. Um, I'm with my friend and we're just, we're laid down on the grass talking to each other. And I don't even know what we were talking about, to be honest, probably boys or, you know, youth club or something at that age. And I just turned because I noticed a movement in the tree and I honestly thought it was going to be a teacher. <laughs> it, right, you know, you caught, oh, a large one at local lads messing about. So I wasn't frightened, but I was immediately like, and then I didn't get time to process anything. This thing just lent out of the bushes and I still struggle to this day to put a name to it. It looked like a man and an ape that had been completely pushed together. Um, so like human eyes, human features, chin, nose, head, hair, the all nine yards, but bigger, much bigger, and teeth like ass, so no canines or anything like that. Um, it was just, it was horrifying. It Just looking at him was enough. I only saw him from chest up. I didn't see all of his body or anything like that. And I'm going to be really 100% honest here because I always am. I acted without thinking. So there was, when I say this next bit, there was no thought involved. 
I looked, I kind of saw a movement, I looked and this thing went out of the bushes at me and I turned to my friend and I pushed her to the floor. Went, really get down on that, he's having you, he's not having me. And I ran and I had this. I still feel bad about that to this day, but there was no conscious thought in it, Craig. It was mm. my feet were up and moving and my hands were pushing into the floor. Yeah. Um, we have spoken about it, you know. <laughs> she calls him the gorilla man, I call him the man eight. I have uh, I look back, I'll be honest, I look back to see if, selfishly to see if he was coming after me. And he'd gone, he'd completely gone. She ran down the steps, I ran the back end of the park. And he'd just gone, he'd completely gone. He'd melted back into those bushes somehow. Um, and I, I actually went back just last month with Mick McLaren, you know, Mick yourself, you've spoken with him. Uh-huh. And we went back and I thought, there's always been a, a kind of weird feeling around that place. I mean, I don't know how to put it into any other words, but it's like, as I get near that building, I feel more and more drunk. So I thought, I'm not going to mention it. I'm just not going to say anything. And Mick said to me, I'm going to see if I can guess where you want to encounter. Mm. So I was like, right, okay, let's do it. He went in his car and I went in mine. Uh, and as we, we pull up and he said to me, was it there? And I said, no, actually it wasn't. Well, that's where he must have come from. I said, and that's where the second witness, the lady who was in her 30s at the time, she saw him in 1984 in that exact spot. Um, so I took him over and I said, I didn't say anything. And as I'm walking, he just, both him and Lee Rosco were both like, oh, oh, I feel really off kilter. Um, one of the ladies that was with us burst into tears. Really? She just was, yeah, uncontrollable crying. And um, so I, 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 I was all right. I wasn't frightened. I'm all right going back there in the day, but. It brings a lot of emotions up when you're there. So I just, I sat on the, the stone wall and they walked around and had a look at everything. Um, and I, when they came back, I said to them, did you feel it? And they were like, you're walking in and out of it. And I said, yeah, you do. You do. That's really interesting, that, because that would seem to suggest some sort of energy or something along those lines. Um, I don't know, maybe a portal or something like that. Do you think it could have been, you know, something like that? And maybe whatever it was you saw was coming through from, from somewhere else? I, I do. I do think that is a, 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 a... I've never cut off a theory. No. So I, I, he looked flesh and blood, but I didn't touch him. So I don't know 100%. But for him to be there is impossible. Yeah. So was he dimensionally somewhere he'd come through to us. So I, I, I immediately, within probably a week, I'd gone to the local library trying to find out what I could. Never got anywhere with that. She gave me stick of the dump. <laughs> I asked her if she had anything on um, cavemen or Neanderthals living today. Right. And she went, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought, oh, thank God for that. She's going to explain it away. Mm. Um, but she didn't, obviously. So you have serendipity in your life, certain things that pop up quite often. And one of them for me is John Dee, uh, the alchemist. Right. And he was said to have visited the building that was there first. So there's like... I have to explain, it was originally a 15th century plague burial site, so that's where we dumped our dead. So you you could buy it for shilling, nobody wanted it. So uh, a chap bought it, I think everyone will know the name, Pilkington, Pilkington Tiles. Mm -hmm. He bought it and put a wooden manor house on there, and when Dee was um, punished and sent up here, there are rumours that him and Edward Keller possibly summoned a tall demon. Now, I'm not saying that's exactly what I saw, but these, not to go off topic, when we were kids outside the manor house, there were four huge stones. Now, when I say huge, I'm five four, so they probably would have come up just at the top of my diaphragm, okay. round. One was um, limestone. You could see all the little creatures in it. The other one was granite. Well, that'll, that'll hold quartz if there's granite in there. One was like, lava or obsidian right. and there was one more that I can't name and they completely vanished so we've been looking for them and one of our team Kaz actually found one of them about two days ago so it's gone from the park and these rocks have been put out I wonder if they were there keeping something out or something in yeah yeah I mean maybe they were, because, yeah. because they were different Storms, maybe there's some significance in the 
the fact that there were four different types of storms, perhaps if they're brought together in some way, you know, there were particular <laughs> types of storm yeah. that were brought together in a certain way. Again, are we looking at some sort of, you know, weird ritual maybe to to try and bring something through from somewhere else. It's fascinating that it's, and it obviously had a massive effect on you. It's obviously still oh. with you. And it's obviously had a massive effect on you. Yeah. There was a missing time event though. It, okay. I didn't realise it till much, much later because as a child, yeah, I had that experience. I mean, for all I was 15, I'd not drunk, you know, you just at 15 in the Northern town, you're just an ordinary lass. Mm. Probably plan for me was get a wed at 17 and that was it. That was all I was ever going to be. So, yeah. um, And I ran from it. I ran from it for a very long time. A, because I was absolutely terrified that he would come and find me. And that's what I had in my head, yeah. that he'd come and find me. I had to go back the next day to school. Yeah. You know, I'd had a number of really weird experiences in that part and I'd never put them together. Now, after interviewing witnesses, thousands of witnesses, I realise that lots of people do that. Mm. So they will have a paranormal event or they'll have a UFO event and they never put them together. And I've never had a UFO event, but I've had a couple of what I would class as warning events when something stopped me dead in my tracks and said, no, turn mm. around and go a different way. As a child, never put them together. I had one where I was um, walking before I'd, I'd seen this. And I could hear something walking at the side of me. Now, there was, the bush wasn't hiding anything. It was probably November. The, all the, the leaves were completely brown. And I, it was there. So I'd have been, if there was anything there, I would have seen it. Mm. But it walked all the way along with me. And as a kid, I got so good at compartmentalising that I just filed, I filed it away. And I never put them together until I started interviewing other witnesses. And they're saying, you know, obviously something's... I can see the bushes moving. I can hear it. There's just nothing there. So it had more than an effect in a way. It it shaped my life, really, really shaped my life because I did it all in secret back then. Yeah. So, I, you know, I'd get on CB radio and ask truckers if they'd saw it out weird on the side of the road and write to um, newspapers, you know, have you had a stranger experience in your area? Yeah. And I did find people i did find other people right. um i mean in my town now i think we're up to seven or eight others that have come forward in the he starts in the 1950s with an old chap right. who saw what he described as um a a chimp drinking from the water oh. now when i said i had the missing time event when i ran from the park i remember running and the next conscious thought i have is coming to on the east lanks road right thinking because there's, there's an area there that's completely overgrown. And I mean, I came to him and I thought, oh, I'm not going to cross that. Because in my mind, he, it, they would be in there. So I went the long way around. Um, but I never put the, I never realised that it was a missing time event. I, I've had to run a good mile and a half and I'd have no memory of it whatsoever. I'm running, I've seen anyone. Do you, do you think that so, – I'm not saying that, that they're all um, this, what I'm about to say, but do you think that some of them could be um, related to exotic animals that have, have, have been released in the past? Because obviously, I mean, we know about the big cat phenomena, and, and although that sort of crosses over into things that – happen that you can't explain some of them you can explain away as them being you know the descendants of panthers or whatever or lynx or whatever yeah. that, that, that were released now going back into victorian times they used to these private zoos had all sorts of things in them didn't they and i yeah, don't i don't doubt that there were there were monkeys or chimpanzees or perhaps even gorillas who knows um, now, I'm not saying that all of these sightings are that, but do you think some of them could be? Do you think, or, or do you think they've interbred or, you know? I, I do. I do think some of them could be. I think we have to take everything on board. So we have to look at it, as you've just said. Is it something that's been released from a menagerie mm. that has managed to survive here and just continue to live and breed, whether that's with us or the them, I don't know. Yes, we have to consider that possibility. Mm. We also have to consider the possibility that they could be a human brother or cousin, yeah. something down the hominid line. Of course, they yeah. could be a wild. Yeah, they could be a wild human. 
Yeah, there yeah. could be, uh, you know, like a, a tribe that we have no yeah. understanding. Some people believe that they come either from Middle Earth or from subterranean, and we just see them when they're maybe getting a food resource or something like that when they're hunting or you know whatever. Um, now there are there's evidence to prove all of them. In all honesty, we have found strange hair samples. And we, we get reports of whooping noises. Right. That's the typical monkey behaviour. It's yeah. whooping and batting in its chest and all of that. We get reports of all that. Right. Uh, we get reports of strange, almost um, monkey-like prints on the floor of the foot. So the, they, their toe, is, their big toe is very different to ours. And we also get these very strange human prints. Right. So they would fall very well into a large human male, probably for a, a, around seven, seven and a half feet. Very normal looking foot, but clearly never been shod. So right. the toes are displayed. Um, and I only take prints into account if there is, I want to see some slippage. I want to see movement. I don't want to see something that's been printed down from above. So if we're talking about a flesh and blood creature that's moving along, there should be movement within the print. It should not be pristine. Um, and there are a couple, now I'm only saying a couple, and they are in private, oh, they're always in private collections, aren't they? Yeah. Here and in America where they have looked at the dermal ridges with on the in the foot and they run the opposite way to ours. Okay. So as I was run across, yeah. these prints run up and down. So, what's so they're, the- either, yeah, they're either incredibly good fakes. You're going to say, what's the theory behind that then? Just that they are like all mam- all mammals. We all evolve differently, don't we? They, they could be anything on the mammalian line. We have to take that in. I once heard a word from um, a paranormal res- in research, and I cannot remember it, and I so wish I could. It was a German word, and it meant that you were able to be different in, in other worlds, so almost changed metaphysically. So you could be in our world and seen solid and, and and fluid, but you were really not of this world. So I just don't know. I think we have to take every single one of those into account. We get bare reports. So what you said there, Hackney Marshes is one area where we get a lot of okay. bare reports, probably from the 70s upwards. Now everyone says, oh, no, it was Cooler Shaker's dog, but I don't, I'm not having it that Cooler Shaker's dog's 40-year-old. You know, what about the ones in the 70s? And even more compelling, they found two bare heads, so actual bare heads. So that would suggest to me that somewhere down on the marshes, there could very possibly be a bear roaming. Same in um, Brecon Beacons in Wales. Right. So I've had people who describe, wild campers who describe a typical bear's behind walking off into the brush. And they're not reporting it as Bigfoot, they are reporting it as a bear. Yeah. Um, Horseshoe Pass, there's two accounts there from different people of what they describe as an upright standing bear, but a bear can stand up, right, you know. Lot yeah. Lomond, two standing bears on Lot Lomond. Um, so the, there's lots of evidence for it out there. I mean, I've had reports from, you know, hyenas, yeah. rhea, beavers. Um, you'd be amazed at <laughs> <laughs> what's running around out there. Yeah, so they're, they're really quite widespread, aren't they? Um mm. Can you can, let, let, can we talk a little bit about BBI then, and and how that yeah, cool. how that came about, uh, what sort of work you do, who's involved with it, um, and you know any more really interesting stories, perhaps some of the more recent ones that you've yeah. you've investigated would be great. Yeah, um, it started back then when I saw it, eighty two. Never had the word um, it, BBR was originally Adam Bird's. Um, creation and it stood for British Bigfoot Research and Adam was a chap that had had an experience in America when he was a child and he, he, when he came over uh, well obviously when he's in his 30s he realised that there was an actual people actually were really interested in Bigfoot in the UK so he opened the group originally just so people could share videos you know like oh I watched this cracking documentary on Bigfoot or, you know I've watched this film just kind of like that really and people started getting in touch with him and saying they're not just in America 
you know, I saw one when I was whatever, and I'm nothing to do with him. I don't even know him by then. I, I'm way out doing my own thing. And I'm finding witnesses, um, witnesses to very similar creatures that I've seen, probably around seven to eight feet tall, completely hair covered, very muscular and wide on the chest, very little neck. Um, and I stumbled across him one day. I think I'd share, actually. There was a, as I said before, there was a lady from 84. Now, she never got in touch with me. She got in touch with a chap called Thomas Markham, and he runs a crypto crew blog in America. And he messaged me and said, Deb, I've had this amazing report come in. You should read it. And you know when you go, yeah, right, okay, I'll have a look later, and you just put it to one side. And he's like, no, you need to read it. It's from your town. And I was like, oh, I was like, so I looked, and it was this woman. And she was saying that she'd saw it really, really similar, but it, she'd seen all of it. And she said it had a male genitalia, like it often gets said. It had this pot belly almost, and this hunched stance, which comes up more and more and more. Um, and as I found each person, and you stay in touch with them, you suddenly realise how many of people are out there are having these experiences, nobody's writing them down. Uh, but I, I couldn't tell it. nobody what to know. It wasn't a UFO, it wasn't paranormal, they were not interested. Mm. And so many doors slammed in my face. Um, and it's not nice, people telling you you're mental or you've made it up or it's all in your head or you're doing it for attention, yeah. all of the above. We've never made a penny doing what we do. We, we're constantly in our overdraft, you know. <laughs> but these people out there like me, who think they're mentally ill because I thought I was mentally ill. You thought you were seen things. I did, I really yeah. did. I thought I was ill. I I'd seen things as a child, and you told if you tell someone long enough that the you must be mental, yeah. eventually it starts to take root. But yeah. then I see the other side, I see all these really credible witnesses, policemen, soldiers, academics, people driving the roads, dog walkers, people just doing ordinary things. And back then I thought, if, it, if it's just like, say it's hysteria and it's a mass hysteria, it'll die off. Mm. It'll just die off and I'll never find another witness again. And that's never, ever happened, ever. And it's, so it's, so then so that's it, right, let's start British Bigfoot properly. Let's get people out on the ground, boots on the ground, see what they can find in the woods. If a report comes in off a witness, give you for example, the Medway River has 16, 16 upright hair creature reports all from different people and families along its route now if i hadn't written them down and plotted them on the map we wouldn't have known that we would have no idea so what do i need i need a person on the medway who doesn't mind going out to talk to this witness mm. and you know whether it's off camera whether it's, it doesn't matter that yeah. but just it shows us where it happens so we can get a size comparison. We can collect data, really. Yeah. Always really in the hopes that it, other people had caught on. And then I started getting people saying, Deborah, what I saw wasn't ape like. It was very dog like. It had a snout and ears on top of its head, all of that. And people slamming doors in my face, they don't want to know. I'm talking to men who are 18 stone bouncers who don't want to go back on work tomorrow because they've got to drive on the same lane. Yeah. It's the thing that we saw. Um, I've had men in tears. I've had females in tears. I've cried myself. So you start collecting them and you say, I've not had that experience, but I know others that have. And you need to speak to each other because once you start to speak to each other, it becomes very validating. I always say, the UK is fickle. If you've had a paranormal report, everyone wants to know it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, let's get an EMF meter and go out in the woods and let's go and investigate it, you know? Yeah. You see a demon or a gin or anything or a Victorian child, people want to know all about it. Yeah, right. If you see a UFO while you're abducted, it, that's great. You say you've seen something that looks like a Neanderthal or a, an ape man and it's like, oh. Yeah, yeah. It, people yeah. think it's less credible, don't they, for some reason? And yeah. I think the number of, of reports, I mean, looking just looking at, at, at your map online, I mean, mm -hmm. there are thousands, are there? absolutely thousands all across the world. And the interesting thing is, I mean, if we just talk about one phenomenon, which is obviously this sort of, you know, this hairy ape type, Sasquatch, yeah. uh, Yeti, what, whatever you want to call it, you go all the way around the world. I mean, in, in Australia, for instance, they have their version yeah. of the Yowie, as you want to know. Yeah. So, 
it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you've got the same sort of sightings. So to me, that has mm. to add a massive amount of credibility to the fact that these things exist. And it's I'm just, so glad that you said that. <laughs> just, well, no, and it's just working out what the flipping heck they are. Because, you know, um, there's so many people see them all, all all over the world. You mentioned about Dogman. I mean, I, I remember when I, when I spoke to um, to Mick, going back a few months now when I, when I first started doing this, and we were talking about Winter Hill. Yes. In particular, which I was, I was, I'd like to ask you about in a bit, actually, because obviously that's quite close to where we both are. Um, yeah. But he did mention that there'd been a sighting of a dogman type creature by somebody there who did, well, didn't it apparently wasn't it running parallel with his car or something when he was driving along through the lanes and he said this thing suddenly appeared in his window and it, it was sort of keeping up with the car um i mean to me that sounds just well frightening to start off with but i've heard yeah. similar stories um I'm sure, in, in, in fact, I think it was Paul Sinclair who, who, who mentioned that there was one happened up there in the northeast, which was exactly the same. Somebody driving a car, and suddenly this massive dog's head appeared by the side of, of the window and, yeah, and, and, and kept up with him as he was driving, you know. So, um, no, I, mean, I know, I know, I know it's really hard to believe, isn't it? But what most people don't realise, and I am in a unique position because every single report I find goes onto an interactive map, which is free, by the way. If you want to use it, you want to go out and have a look at the cases or investigate some photos, I would absolutely love that because I can't be all over the UK. But the Yorkshire coast from Kent, from, I mean, the south, the, Deborah, start again. The east coast from Kent, all the way up to the Scottish border, every single report is canine in origin, right. and there are many, probably over 25. Right. Yorkshire itself has a huge number of... You tend to get different descriptions, Craig, so you'll get the typical werewolf, hammer house, you know, nose, dog's legs, paws, tail, but then you'll get this almost human, dog-headed thing... Lots of reports in um, Rochdale of the wolf-headed men, believe it or not, you know. When really? you start digging, you'd be amazed what you find. But, yeah, um, Canic Chase, another place where you get a lot of canine cryptids. Um, Snowden, I took a report from a, um, a lady who worked for one of the, she worked on Channel 4 on one of the afternoon quiz shows. Oh. And she was interviewing one of my members and she said to him, what are your hobbies? And he said, well, um, I'm into cryptids. And she didn't know what it was. And he said to her, it's like the study of um, animals that are not supposed to exist, so like dog men or Bigfoot and things. And he said the line went quiet. So he thought, oh, I've scared her off. And she said, I've never told anyone this before. Uh-huh. But in 2012, I was on Mount Snowden and I saw this creature. And it had a dog's head, but it had a man's body and it was completely hair covered and it just vaulted over a fence and ran off from her. Um, we don't tend to get the big scary American reports, but honestly, seeing that, I often say to people, before you ridicule someone, just have a think about when you walk the dog at half past eight at night and it's going dark and you're walking along and you really relax. What would you do if something stepped out from that tree line or from behind that fence it was probably twice the size of your width ways yeah. and at least two foot taller than you with snarling teeth. Mm. And you could smell it and see steam coming off it, you know? What do you expect that witness to do? Why didn't you get a photograph? Why didn't you phone out? I would be a puddle on the floor. Exactly, yeah. That was, I, all I would want to get is out of there alive. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you don't have time to take your phone out and start going through all your apps, do you, to find your, to find your camera and then no, it's just... still while it focuses. <laughs> no, I know. But then we see BBR again, then we have to expand again. I always thought in the UK it was really easy to report a UFO or a reptilian. Mm. Apparently not, because then people started getting in touch with me who had seen reptilian folk or people shape-shifting. So that's why it became being believed investigation. So what I say is if you want to contact us regardless of what your experience is, or if you just have a genuine interest, that's fine. Come 
come and join us, you know. We we get together once a fortnight on YouTube and we all have a chat and me and Debbie will be on and we'll talk so that they can chat in, chat in the top the box with each other. And then on a Saturday, I do the same, but it's not live. It'll be an hour of uh, reports that have come in. And it's just to run the chat box so people can talk to other folk without <laughs> getting the side eye. Yeah, or, yes, without you feeling know. vulnerable or or yeah. they're going to be ridiculed. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. that's well, yeah, that's fair enough. You, you mentioned there about um, reptilians. Mm-hmm. Yes, we've got a case in Preston, not too far from you, you know, on the staff. Really? I do. Yeah. Um, there is a large, uh, I'm not going to say where it is, but let's say it's a headquarters, a civil service headquarters. Okay. And there is a lady who works there who's quite well off. Uh, up. So she said, uh, it's an ordinary day, absolutely ordinary day, nothing strange whatsoever. She said, I've finished about half past 30, uh, about, oh, Deborah, about 8 30. It's dark, it's November. So it's a bit misty, but that's normal for us in in North, isn't it? A little, just yeah. a little bit, and not a fog, but a little bit of mist. Mm. So I'm in the car park, I pull out, and I think, naturally, you look left and you look right to make sure no crime's coming. She looked left, nothing. She looked right, and she saw what she described as an eight-foot sneering reptilian, really. Um, she said he was thickly muscled, and when she noticed him, she said there was definite contact she felt that he was probing up a mind for her memories and things and she said it was incredibly hard to break contact with him and she did everything that she could to do that um and she just drove the car but she had to go back to work mm. you know and then i said to her is that the only time you've ever experienced anything like that and she went no no actually um when I was much, much younger, we were in a, a I think in the 20s, there were lots of them at a friend's flat. And she said, we weren't drinking or anything. We were just having coffee and chatting. And the, there's a gentleman on the couch and she said, for a split second, he came, became very lizard-like. And she said, without thinking, I said, oh, you almost changed into a lizard there. And she said, he looked right at her and he said, yeah, I do that sometimes. Really? Mm. Now, that is... That is weird, isn't it? I mean, I know, yeah. <laughs> I know Preston Town Centre quite well. Um, I've worked in Preston myself actually for for twenty odd years, um, and ironically, I work in Salford now. But anyway, <laughs> um, you, you had, uh, there you go. Um, <laughs> but I know that the the offices that it probably was, are right in the centre. So it's a very built-up area, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's a very urban area, uh, yeah. which makes it even more surprising. You have to wonder sometimes whether, you know, there are certain people who have an ability to see paranormal. Um, yes, yeah. So are there people then that have an ability to see these type of events where you've actually got somebody who is perhaps, as we talked about before, phasing mm. in and out, shifting, almost yeah. shape shifting sort of, um, but almost dropping that guide that they've got, that facade, yeah. just moving a little bit out of, so that most normal people can't, normal's not the right word, most other people can't see them doing it. But if you've got yeah. that, that ability just to be able to maybe pick it, pick it up, even though you don't know you've got that ability, perhaps you can, you know, these, you know, perhaps she could see this person just phasing out a little bit. Um, yeah, I think, I think I, I would agree with that. Yeah, I would agree with that one. I didn't explain it very well, but you know what I mean, the sort of ability. I do. I think certain people, um, for me, it's places. So I can get, I know when I'm on a ley line. I have no, I know exactly when, I know when I'm approaching a ley line. So I get myself ready. There's loads places, of loads of I know, I know. I, I, so that's me. That's my. That's what I can do. So I'm really staticky, and I think I just kind of tuned into the earth energy. But it could be that certain people can see past a disguise. It could also be that some beings will appear in a way you will accept them in an almost trickery kind of way, or absolutely terrify you to feed on your fear so we've got a lot of things going on haven't we it could be that he for some reason at that moment let his facade slip 
and she saw the true him. And she definitely said that he was almost sucking thoughts and memories out of her, you know. Uh, but she's not the only one. I spoke to, um, I went to Probe, uh, I think it was 2018, with Chris Turner. I was speaking at Probe and there was a young chap there and he'd come out because he was in the army. Um, probably he lives on the Wirral, so, you know, not far from us. Mm. But he was in the army in Germany and he'd been struggling with this event for so long. That's why he went to Probe. He wanted to just speak to other people to say, look, is this, what I've seen is, is this, you know, is that a reptilian? He said he was in his barracks. Um, it was about 10.30. He was having, you know, I, I mean, he must have been off because he was, unless he had ships, I don't know. I've never been in the army. But he said it was about 10.30. He was in bed. It was really comfortable, really nice. And he saw something standing at the end of his bed. And he, he describes a typical, actually drew a typical reptilian looking uh, being. But he had a belt and he said below the belt, there was nothing. You couldn't see anything. It was almost like it just materialised up above. Yeah. Similar thing, really, reading his thoughts. Um, it terrified him and, it, and he went to his superiors and they suggested that he was ill. And, and he took some time off, you know, and that's the problem, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can imagine something like that's going to have a, a massive effect on you. You know, you're not, you're not going to be the same again, are you? Once you've seen something like that. So. Yeah. Not at all. That's, that's really interesting. I've never heard those before, those stories before, Debbie. So that's that's a, that's the first that, thing, and, and and they are that's really interesting. It, it, you know, they really are, and they're quite scary as well, actually. Aren't they? Well, <laughs> you know. one question you've not asked me, and everybody always asks me, is what am I frightened of? What frightens me? Because obviously, I hear all of this. I'm not really frightened anymore. That's gone for me now. I'm not great at night in the dark outside, so I don't do a whole lot of that, I'll be honest. But otherwise, nothing really scares me, but I do not like the invisible life forms, the ones that are almost predator-like. You know, like the film, I don't yeah. like them at all. Okay. Seeing, seeing what's hunting you, stalking you, mm. is one thing. But being stalked by something you can't see has an old another notch two notches i reckon for me yeah. you know where it is people talk about them walking in behind them craig right. circumventing and coming up in front of you yeah and you hear those bushes moving but you cannot see what's moving them i don't like that <laughs> so you you sort of have the um the feeling that something's there you have that you see it prismatically so there's lots of names for them some people call them glimmer men Others call them prismatic beings, um, electromagnetic beings. There's almost a shimmer, like in the film. You know, when you see the predator move in the film, you can make out his form, even though he's not there, because it's this very fluid movement, almost like that. But I've had them in sizes from probably two foot. One lady said there was one up in the tree, and it was reflecting its surroundings. Right. Which I think really, for me, I thought that's a good way of explaining it. That so it's not invisible, hmm. but it's showing you the surroundings so you cannot tune into that wherever it is. But you can hear it, like I say, but you just can't see it. Um, there was a chap in Henley, you know, where they have the regatta. Yeah, he was a tree surgeon, and he said when we worked away all week, we'd just stay in a caravan because it was cheaper. And that's where they are. He names the pub, and he's on the map. If anyone wants to look, and he said. About six o'clock at night, I've had my tea and I'm just resting. He said, and I can hear what he presumed was kids smashing through the woods. And he was really annoyed because he's worked all day. Yeah, you know. And he said, I got my boots back on and I went out. And he said, I could see it smashing, but I couldn't see it. And it was moving through those branches really fluidly. That's what he said. It, it, it was just like it was walking on a pavement. Wow. And he goes, can you imagine? What do you do? You've got to sleep there that night. <laughs> And you, you, wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't sleep, would you? Simple as that. It, it, and you process it, you know? Yeah, I know. It, it makes you wonder, doesn't it, that, you know, some of these Hollywood films then that, that you know, you think is, is, is completely made up and it's somebody's imagination and it's all, you know, fantasy and everything else. I mean, is there some spark of truth in there? Um, mm, I, are, yeah. are we being... drip um, yeah, are are we being programmed to to accept these things once all of a sudden, almost like disclosure with with UFOs? You know, yeah, are we? Being programmed? I totally agree. 
you know. Oh, my theory is 100%. Because years and years and years ago, when psychics very first came out, they were seen as flukes. And it, so yeah. after that, they just get cast for the ghost and every haunted house thing you saw, it was ridiculous. It was a ghost in a sheet. Every psychic was a crazy, you know, gypsy rose leg. Yeah. So it ridicules it. It makes, them, it makes it a thing of jest. And then they did it, as you know, to the UFO mm. realm. So you got all of the cartoonish alien greys and the films that they do. and It just almost makes it normalised, but I think they cartoon it. So the minute you raise the subjects, it becomes ridiculous. Most of uh, the children's films that have been out in the last two years have been Yeti-based or Bigfoot-based. Yeah. There's a, no- a number of them, um, and I've noticed that. I said the same. I said the same to my husband. Yeah. But one another thing that I've noticed is, disc- as you talk about disclosure, I set up... Um, like alerts so if anything a story pops up in the media i'm onto it straight away yeah. so i've noticed over the last 18 months that we've gone from completely di- denying unidentified objects to saying well actually yeah we do have them yeah. obama himself said you know the president of israel said mm. more and more disclosure by people that are very very um we wouldn't scoff at them. We, yeah. You know, yeah. he, he knows his stuff and he's saying, mm. I've got um, a tape of four pilots. It's out there. Anyone can find it. A, a chap from Dublin got in touch with me and he had a really scary uh, experience. So I said, I'll have a look. One of the things I can do is have a look and see if I can find any other reports in your area. Over Dublin Bay, there are hundreds of UFO reports. Yeah. But this is audio capture. And it's four pilots for each from different companies hmm. all phoning in saying there is something in circle in the plane. We're right. above double play. What is going on? And you hear them all talking about it. And they're talking to the radio tower and the radio tower are saying, we cannot see it. We cannot see it on the radar. Colin, why was that not in every newspaper known to run or on a telly? You know, it's just, yeah. it just baffles me. It absolutely baffles me. So when I shown him, it was it was great for him because he was like, oh, thank God for that, you know. I'm not, I'm not a crackpot. I really did see what I saw. I suppose, but, I suppose there are a lot of, um, a lot of sort of questions around something like that as to why it isn't out there in, in the public domain. And I think a lot of it's to do with reactions, panic. There's a lot of religious implications as well, isn't yes, there? Yes, you know, there is. You know. There's all sorts of stuff, in there, but Which I think is one of the reasons why, I mean, we're going off, tra- off track a bit aren't we, with the UFO stuff. But, it's fine. No, it's you know, fine. I think, I think that's probably why disclosure hasn't come yet. But you're right. I mean, there was a, there was a, there was a Canadian... Um, uh, guy wasn't there? Was he? Was he part of ex Canadian government or, or something like that? Who, again, um, he he was absolutely adamant, wasn't he? That that UFOs were real, that aliens were real, that contact with them. Yeah, I'm sure we have. I'm sure we have. And it, it, I'm saying, yeah, yeah, I'm saying. I've, I've interviewed people. I said it today. I've yeah. interviewed numerous people. Once I, I interviewed a chap, and I thought at any moment he was going to look lick his eye. He's the most <laughs> reptilian man I've ever met. And he had almost, his pupils were really strange. Yeah. And it was a really hard interview. And that normally when you get in your flow, with, when, once your nerves are gone and you're in the flow, the interview goes really well. It was literally like talking to a robot. Really? I was having to pull like information out of him. And I never, in the end, I never put the, I just got a really bad vibe off him. So I never put the really interview sort of paused and, and just. Mm, I felt more like I was being interrogated right. more. Yeah. Oh. Then I was interviewing him. Um, yeah. I don't know. I just got a really bad feeling. I always go off my gut. So if I get a really bad gut feeling, I'll, yeah. I'll listen to it. And with him, I did. And I just, as I hung up, I said to Matt, I'm not putting that out there. I don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's, let's go over then to, to some, um, some cases that are quite sort of local to us. Yeah. Because obviously we're in the, in the Northwest of England, you're in Greater Manchester. I'm, probably what about 25 miles north of you something like that so yeah. you know, there's there's a lot of um we've got winter hill we've got pendle hill we've got yeah Poland, we've got um york yeah long fell all yeah. of that but there are reports there actually yeah. i do have Boland, for instance we have two reports 
First one is a couple who are on the Trumper Trail. Right. And they see what they she the lady described as a hairy naked man, uh, probably about seven feet tall, just running. Um, and that was it. There was nothing. There was no. It didn't do anything. It just ran. And she said it was definitely not a, a human man, but he was clearly male. Mm. Um, then we have a, a young lass was in the uh, bowl of uh, Boland with a father, and she said, "You know, as kids, you just run off and play in the woods. That's what you do when you're on holiday." And she said, "I noticed something watching me from within the bushes, and I'm I'm thinking it's one of my brothers or my sisters, and you know they're going to jump out on me, kind of play a trick on me." She said, "So I jumped down, and I'm kind of he'd not it had not noticed her." And she's waiting for her brother to jump out. And she said, it moved. And when it moved, it was what you would call a werewolf. She said it had a snout. It was completely black in hair. She said it was kind of sat on its haunches like you would around a fire. Yeah. Um, And she said it didn't do anything. It didn't try and come near her or anything like that. But she said without thinking, she ran. And as she turned around, she ploughed right into a blooming tree and, and, and broken nose. So it was a really, really memorable um, experience for her. A couple of years later, a chap gets in touch with me as a wild camper and he's up on crags at Boland. Yeah. And he said, I've just got a little wildfire going kind of thing, Deb. Um, and he suddenly notices out of the light of the fire, something moving around. And he said it was moving uh, in a very strange way, Deb. It was hunched on its arms, arches. Mm. And it was kind of moving around. And each yeah. time it passed, it'd get a little bit closer. And I said to him without thinking, because I was really naive back then, I said, why don't you just get up and move? And he said, because I thought it'd get me. Mm. He's like, I'm in a position where I'm in the middle of bowling dead. It probably took me three hours to walk in. Yeah. I felt safer when we back up to that rock and the fire in front of me, then the actual thought of walking out with it behind me, and I was like, I'm really sorry, I should have took that into account. He's never wild camp since. Never. No. And it's just, it's so sad when they say that. Because yeah. it, it is, I mean, it's a massive area. I mean, the Forest of Bowl in itself is a massive area, isn't it? Um, and the, there's all sorts of terrain. I mean, there's there's rivers, there's woodland, there's moorland. You've got um, Ward Storm, for instance, which is the highest point. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's it's 2,000 feet almost above sea level. Yeah. So, you know, that sort of environment is obviously... It's lush. It's absolutely lush, isn't yeah. it? And we've got all the rivers and streams. I mean, yeah. must, there's over... Uh, I think it's over 50 estuaries in the UK. Yeah. And you think of how many streams and brooks run off there. Yeah. Boland's a fantastic place. Yeah. If you start looking at the streams and looking at them as highways, you mm. get from Boland, you go to Cumbria, Scotland, Yorkshire, over the moor. You could down down a massive way and pick up the reports there. Um, the north west of England... Most of our reports follow the Irwell Fale, the, um, the River Dove. Um, just, I, I can't get them all to mind. The guy um, to mind at the moment. But even it, it, just go on a slide, just go to Ramsbottom, um, Holcomb Common. We've got reports there from Service Culture. Yeah. yeah. Where the old Crips and Factor site used to be. On yeah. the I mean, you mentioned Rochdale. I mean, that up there were um, our bets, the, the pub, yeah. they're really high up, isn't it? You know, and it's on the old. Yeah. Um, it's on the old road, isn't it? That you know where the, the 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 merchants used to used to go off. Yeah, the, yeah. The tops, you know. Um, I mean, there's reservoirs up there. Um, I mean, just going just going back to what we were mentioning before about Winter Hill. There's obviously mm. something really odd going on at Winter Hill, yeah. isn't there? I mean, do you yeah. what what what's your thoughts on that? I mean, I remember when I spoke to Mick. You know, he was he was he was you know told me some really interesting stuff about what you found up there. Um, do you have any updates? Yeah. You know, do, 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 what 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 do you think is going on at Winter Hill? Because there's obviously something, I, isn't there? Yeah, there's definitely something going on, but I think it might be more than one thing. Okay. I think we, we we've got to uh, to take that into consideration. We do get a number of big cat reports, which is Bolton, Bolton itself, Horwich, Halliwell. Is the 22 reports to date oh. of a large black cat okay. now i think we see the black ones more somebody we were in sherwood this weekend and one of the chaps said it and i thought i never thought of that mm. and he said because if they're beige they, they blend in so you, we're seeing the black ones and i thought that's really credible 
yeah, that's like really, really incredible. I've lost my thread, Craig. What did you ask me again? About Winterfell, what do you think's going right. on? Hill. Yeah, so we take into consideration that some of the sheep kills that we find are possibly big cat kills because you've got the march on the neck, the typical cat will go in by the belly or the back end, typical signs of cat, and we've got some yellow-eyed reports. Mm-hmm. Now, that would suggest to me that there are large cats moving around on winter hill. Some of the kills, though, are really strange in the, in the sense that the, 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 the animal, now you're probably thinking of like a hue, there's some weight in a hue, mm. grabbed by the fleece and rammed into the wall. Yeah. And the, the, the spines are literally twisted. Um, some of the, the feet, it's, the legs are snapped and twisted. And on some of those kills, the one thing that stood out to me the most was normally, if it's a human that's done it, they'll take the meat and they'll take the fleece because there's money in them, isn't there? Uh Um, The fleece had been removed. It was still there, but it had been removed like you'd take the skin off a chicken. So it's a natural skinning technique. You get your hand between the the fleece and the thing, and that's what it was like. None of the meat had gone. Right. It was really strange. Um, So that tells me that there's a possible, more than likely, big cat up there killing. But, we, as I say, a cat's not got hands, so it's not removing a fleece, right? And it's not running a sheep, a big ewe, right into the wall. It's not doing it. We've got a couple, two lads go up. Only October of last year just gone. Um, and they are going up rabbiting. So they get out of the car. It's night time. It's about 12 o'clock at night. I won't be walking on the hill at 12 o'clock at night simply for mechanical injury alone you know it's not for me but they know they know they know what they're doing yeah um and he said they just you know they've got the torches got the red torches and whatever and he said i nearly stepped on a dead sheep and he said when we shine the torch on it the rib cage has been ripped into two and it's still steaming mm. so whatever had done it had done it within probably heard them coming up the hill talking us humans you know what I mean we're right noisy probably heard the car door well honestly Craig probably heard the car door slam yeah right so you've got these two chaps and they're going up Winter Hill they're going rabbit in uh, head torches on little hand torches and they almost step onto a dead sheep and when they shine the torch on the sheep the rib cage has been completely ripped in half um, and it's steaming mm. So that tells me that whatever's done, it's not too far away. And he said, we immediately hear a growl. Change that for a cat. They would normally just hang back until you've gone and then do what they want to do. And he said, this growl started around them. And they described what they saw as eye shine, but it was about this up as if something was standing up. Um, well, well, that's like a good. warning, isn't it, that? It's like a warning, isn't it? Yeah. Get away. That's what I thought. Yeah. And you got really frightened, which is understandable. One of the lads said, I looked at me gun. I didn't see anything, but I knew that whatever was out there, I'd be better using my gun as a club. So mm-hmm. I turned it around in my hand. How frightened have you got to be to do that? So was it like, said, a, like, sorry to interrupt, was it like, like a yeah. two to air rifle or something like that? Was he? Yeah, he just yeah. a rabbit gun. Just, and he's just, thinking, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. So he turned it around and he said, in my head, I'm thinking, I've got. I'll use the stock as yeah. a bat. Yeah. I've got more. That's how, that's how scared he were. And he said the growling followed them right back to the car. Mm. So it came with them back to the car. Um, then we've got a lady, like you'll remember back in the olden days when we'd, we'd all go out clubbing and clubs are short. Everyone would go and meet at River Services. Yeah. And we'd be up River. So she's up at Chinese Garden with a group of people. And she said, obviously, Carl, we'd go in a circle and I'll well, put lights on. She said, I needed a pee. So <laughs> I nipped off and, and went for the way. And she said, I'm there. And as I went to pull my pants up, this thing just walked out of the woodland. And she said, it was a man, but it had a head like a bear. It was completely air covered, like a snout, like a bear. And she ran and broke her ankle. Um, and she said, yeah. And she said, 25 years on. She's still having trouble with her ankle because of that incident. Yeah. Now, it just, the, the accounts on there are really, really strange. We've got people who have been followed down, let's say escorted. So in the, the year when uh, we lit all the beacons for the Queen, 
Mm. There was lots of people up when Sir Hill wiped up his gorge. Everyone's up there. You're watching it, aren't you? And this is a, a girl and two uh, two friends, got two dogs with them. They're doing the same thing. And she said another group come up. They went down White Copper's Gorge one way. She's gone down White Copper's Gorge another way. The dogs picked up on something. They heard a growl, and she said they were definitely shadowed down that hill. She Mm. bumped into one of the other crowd. No, I'm getting this wrong. It's a friend. A friend bumped into one of the other crowd because they worked together. And she said, oh, it was great last night. I wasn't seeing you up there. And she went, yeah, but did anything happen when you were walking back down? And she said, no, not to me. She said, but the lad, the last lad on as we're walking down kept saying, something's behind us, something's following us. So something unseen in the dark has taken them, followed them down to the bottom of the hill. Now that could be something terrifying, something out to get you, you know. But Mick finds two ladies and they've both got stories of a dog that took them down to save death. So one lassie's up there and she said, we let it get too late, we're idiots. The sun went down and we realised we were in a real, really dangerous situation. This black dog just appears out of nowhere. Right. She said it wouldn't let us stroke it and it kept the same distance between us all the time. Right. And if we got held back, it would stop and wait for us to catch up to him. And she said it took us right down to George's Lane and we were fine. And this other lady said she was up there with her daughter, January, she said, and like a fool, I realised once we got up there that we had to go back down with all the ice. And she said, and I was really frightened. And this dog just appeared out of nowhere, this black dog. She said, it wouldn't let us pet it. We tried shouting it over, it wouldn't come. She said, and at first I was a bit frightened of it. Mm. She said, but we just followed it where it walked, we walked. And she said, it waited for us. And it escaled him down to the bottom of the air. So did that, did they give any, any indication then of whether they thought it was solid um, a living thing or maybe something more paranormal did they sort of I think both I think that it appeared in its as a typical black dog what some people would call a shuck yeah yeah yeah, looked, I say, yeah yeah it looked flesh and blood mm. and there's another lady on squirrel lane which is just the other side of the hill she was going to work in the morning about six thirty six o'clock in the morning and she said if I, I miss me bus I'd have to walk and it was really dark and I was worried. And she said, that morning it was slippery with ice and I missed the bus. She said, and this black dog appears from nowhere and starts to walk her up Squirrel Lane. And she said, she was the only one who said it was kind of ethereal. She said it just suddenly disappeared. So mm. once it got to safe day, it just didn't shed. I don't know whether it walked into the farm, but it was nowhere. And they all said that. They don't know where it went. Yeah. But to them, it seemed flesh and blood, but it was definitely doing a guardian thing. I wonder how many other people mm. around that hill have had a similar experience, you know? Because it's quite a peculiar sort of, um, well, I, I, would, I wouldn't even say northern, I said northwestern um, uh, <laughs> phenomena, isn't it? That it, it There's all sorts of names in the trash and striker and pad oh, and all yeah. And, and, and I guess back, and gist and that's um, right. going back ugh. hundreds of years, the stories, isn't there? You know, going back back many, many years um of these sort of spectral black dogs that, that appear. Um but it's interesting that because they're usually associated with something bad happening. So it's yes, most, it, yeah, no. I know most people it's, think that. Yeah. Yeah, most people think that, but when you you said earlier that there are cultures all around the world that have the same kind of creature, cryptid, I don't know what, being, I don't know what to put words to it, but they don't communicate. Back then you couldn't communicate, but they all have the same description. Yeah. Shook's very similar. Some are often described as having red eyes um, and some are close to almost like phantom dogs so you can see through them and things like that. Normally when they're seen, somebody dies, it's seen as a harbinger as death. But what somebody once pointed out to me and said, there's an old Celtic legend about a black dog that comes to walk you home at the head, the end. Okay. So maybe in some cases we see them and then Uncle Fred dies and we're like, it's that black dog's fault mm. that Uncle Fred died. But it might be that that dog came to walk Fred home. But you, you can speak to, I've spoken to people who... Um, are ill, very terminally ill and close to the end. 
and they will see a, a very benevolent dog sometimes, but in other cases, very uh, an awful black dog that will stalk them almost to the end. And you, they're the, the ones that normally, what, they want to tell me something that they've never told anybody else before because it's free when you get it off your chest. And mm. I think some people have an awful end um, and it might be because of acts that they've done in the life, you know, you can't stop any of that. You can't interfere with any of it. So you've got to let it roll out. Um, but you can try and make it smaller in the mind for them. So you can give them some like protection rituals to go through, just anything to empower. Because the more powerful you are, the weaker that will become, you know, or the more frightened you are, the stronger that will become. Um, so I try and work with people on that level and say, no, it sounds hard. You've got to stand up. And not in this house, you do not cross this boundary. You know, you've got to do that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, mystery black, awful dogs that <laughs> suddenly appear out of nowhere. And then some poor folk, you know, some poor fella in your family passes away, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they're everywhere. Yeah, they're, they're in every region in the UK. Yeah, they're in everywhere. England in folklore, aren't they, really? Um, so, yeah. So, so. yeah. Yeah, very strange. Um, just, just one more then before we, mm -hmm. we sort of go on to um, how we can contact you and um, where we yeah. can see the map and that because the map's brilliant. I've, I've looked at it and I can spend hours just, you know, going all over the club looking at all the different ones. I mean, obviously, you sort of tend to look at the area where you live and, you know, you're right. Yeah. There's, there's an awful lot goes on in, in, you know, in this area around here. Um one of the one of the obvious famous ones that's been going on recently, and, and I spoke to another one of your um, uh, guys, Lee Nicholson, um, about yeah. the the um, calf mutilation that was up at Todmorden last year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's quite a that's quite a, a, a strange one. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think it ties into Winter Hill as well um, because he the the chat was called Alex um, who found it. Let me get it right, Alex. Tapper, I'd have to go back and Albert. check. It was called Albert. Yeah, Albert. Yeah, it was Albert Tayas. There we go. I've got it right. Yeah. Messaged me and said, Deb, um, I'm up here walking and found this strange car up near Shepherd's Rest. So up that way. Yeah. So he took some photographs, which was ace. So we managed to see it. Like it's it's this bullock, it's in a it's in a field for sheep. Mm. Uh, only a young thing, no ear tag, um, a bit strange. And the mutilations on it were really weird. So it was almost laser-like. There's no blood on the ground. Yeah. The seam is completely clear. Dogs normally use a, leave a right mess, so you'll see, like, blood, guts, all entrails, and they dig in with the feet dogs, so they make a mess of the ground. None of that. Mm. It was pristine. And dare I say it, it almost looked like it had been dropped from above. Yeah. Now, I've got reports on the hill and Todder, Hebden Bridge, um, and a number of places where people have missing time events or UFO events. Yeah. And some of them actually come to quite far away. One poor chap woke up on Gadding's Down, not yeah. too far from where they found it, with a, a, like a, an implant in his neck, a ball bearing in his neck. Right. And, COVID, couldn't get out there to meet him. Um, and I asked him, I said, would you let me guide a counter it? And he's he like, yeah, of course, you know. But that calf stayed out there. Nobody claimed it. It was out there a long time. Nothing predated on it either. No. But I think it's connected to the cases at Lubbock Lane because there was a farmer back in the day that had numerous cattle mutilations, had a visit from the government, and suddenly people were not allowed to investigate on his land anymore. Yeah. I think it possibly is the same farm in all that. I'm going to be really truthful with you. Um, and there are very similar cases. So Mick goes up to investigate. Mm. And while he's up there at the Shepherd's Rest, the we've got the cameras. We always have kit when we go out. So you've got like camera gear and your tripods and stuff. And most of us are in out dog game like that. so you kind of stand out and she was like oh what are you doing and he said uh, well I'm up here actually investigating a case and she went oh oh you know about the chap in the, the house that moved off the moor and never come back don't you? and she was like no no and she was like well he's a serving police officer he was from Liverpool when he retired they bought the house on the on the moor grandkids had come over and stay as normal and he, she said one night he got up for a pee in the middle at night, saw something in out on the moor, wouldn't tell him what he'd seen. Um, and he packed them up and moved them, went back to live at his daughter's address 
and sold the house on the. I mean, you know what the hills are. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's so hard that you to get a property up there. It's, oh, God, yeah. And he never went back to that house. Never went back to that house. Well, and I don't blame seen, you. Know. No, I must have seen something, man. He's seen. got to have done, you know. He really has really yeah, got yeah. to have done. But Mick knows more about that case than me. Mm. See, I'd worked the Bearman reports and the Red Eyed reports on the hill. I mean, we work together all the time. Yeah. But yeah. Um, Mick's boots on the ground, he can do what I can't do. So we were out this weekend in Sherwood, to be honest. Uh, this month, last month, we were in Harrogate. Month before, we were in um, Round Hay in York. Uh, we, we've been everywhere. But as we invite people out, we say, oh, come out and have a brew. And we just sit around and we have a natter. That's what we did at Sherwood. I'll go all mixed days overnight with them and just like a, a night um, camping out. So our next one's at Forest of Boland at the end of this month. So if anybody's interested in coming out, just email me. Um, or yeah, Honestly, all you got to do is put Debbie Hartswell, Bigfoot, into YouTube and I will pop up. And I will answer every email. It might set me a couple of days, but I will answer them all. It's really informal. We don't expect you to have any experience. You don't have to have seen or heard anything. If you're interested in the subjects and you just like talking about it, just come out and have a brew with us and a piece of cake, because that's what we do. We just sit around in a circle and we all have a natter and we get to know each other. And each time, more people come. Yeah. And you, I used to sit, they're really nervous for a minute, and I used to do talking. And then I sit back and they all start talking to each other and it's lovely to see, you know. And they're just finishing each other's sentences and, oh, do you watch this show? What do you think about this podcast? It's, um, it's honestly, I'd, I'd work every day I could just to see that once a month. It's brilliant to see them all. And you make a new friend, don't you? You make someone you can say, have you seen this video? I want you yeah. <laughs> so what's the... Um... What what's the address for the for the map the um, the big map that you've done? I think it's just Deborah Hatswell's cryptid map. Okay. It'll come up under that, yeah. But if they struggle, my email I can well you could pop the email in the description for them. I will do. Just, yeah. It's just Debbie Hatswell at gmail dot com, all yeah. lowercase. Yeah. Uh, but it'll come up if you, if you Google Debbie Hatswell's. Uh, I've been around that long. Yeah. <laughs> Pop up, but especially for Brits. I mean, it's not the same if you're in America, but for the Brits, I'd be probably one of the first that come up in your, in your search engine. Just reach out, just get in touch, or, or get in touch with Colin and ask Colin. And yeah. just say, I really fancy that, you know, or if you've heard of what, the places that we've spoken about tonight, if it's jogged a memory, or you thought, well, you know, my Auntie Doris, or remember that time when we were kids, please get in touch. Because even if you think it's not important, if I can get it on that map, it gives me a massive understanding of what's going on yeah. around the time. So if you've heard a noise, I want to hear about it. If you've seen yeah. strange footprints, I want to know about it. Just anything, anything, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, and it will just let me know. And then we can, if you want to come out and meet Mick and go out and do the investigation with him, he's up for that. He's out. We're always happy for people to come out with us. You know, just pop along. <laughs> it's a bit, you need boots. It's a bit. Sheep up there. You'll need yeah, some yeah, yeah. dirty roots, but you'll be eating your wellies. No <laughs> That's brilliant. That's great. Well, thank you. Thanks, Debbie. It's been um, it's been really good talking to you. Um, really interesting stuff. Some some stuff that you've mentioned there that I've never heard of before. So, um, and I hope that um, uh, people that are listening to this have enjoyed it as much as I have because it's been great. Thank you very much, and um, hopefully we'll catch up again soon. Yeah, you're very very welcome. If you need me to come back on, just let me know, and I'll make sure I'm free. I will do. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you to Debbie for doing the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Remember, you can go to my website, which is www.craigbryant.co.uk. Thank you for listening, and remember to keep watching the shadows.